Hurricane Sandy crashing on shore. Winds now at 90 miles per hour, and this storm is so big, so vast, 60 million Americans will feel its power. In the wake of any disaster, it seems like a lot of public commentary goes into trying to figure out why we keep seem to be repeating the same mistakes. Why do we keep rebuilding in the same place when it's so irrational? With something like climate change, one of the tools that we often see are maps. And with something like flood risk, for instance, what we see in the United States are flood risk maps. And not just maps of flood risk, but maps that are connected to the rating of insurance premiums through the National Flood Insurance Program. In October of 2014, for instance, uh, the comptroller of New York City released a report and he said that New York City now has $129 billion of property at risk of flooding. And the way that he was able to come up with that figure is because of this flood insurance rate map. It was a way to help make an economic case for preparing for climate change. This language of value at risk, which is meant to help us find ways to be and feel more secure, when you actually went to New York and you talked to New Yorkers, that information was very scary. And, and the, the map that made it possible, this flood insurance rate map, was described to me by a resident of Rockaway, Queens, as scarier than another storm. Some people were going to have to pay for flood insurance for the first time. For some people, their premiums were going up from the hundreds of dollars per year to the thousands of dollars per year. And these are non-trivial costs in the neighborhoods in which these changes were most pronounced. The flood was one thing, but the flood insurance now seemed poised to price them out of communities that they loved, communities where they'd spent their whole lives. And so the map becomes scary because it seems to be a source of economic risk. People were also worried about climate change, um, but in this very uneven way, because the maps themselves don't actually factor in climate change. They didn't even factor in Hurricane Sandy. But on the ground in New York City, it wasn't clear to people whether this was a signal, perhaps, of truly what the future would hold for New York. When policymakers like the Comptroller use a term like value at risk, they're really talking about property value. People were worried about so much more than that. People felt that if they were really going to be priced out of these neighborhoods, then they weren't just losing an asset. They were losing an emotional attachment to a place. They were losing social connections to their neighbors. They were losing really the sense of identity that was kind of connected to their experiences and their histories living in particular parts of New York. So the decision of kind of what to do with this information immediately became much more complicated. Excavating values at risk, which will be different in different places for different groups of people and at different times, that helps us to understand actually what people experience when they're trying to make these decisions. It's never a simple cost-benefit calculation in the context of someone's actual life. And so if we can be attentive to that, if we can kind of expand our angle of view so that we're thinking not just about financial value and not just about natural hazard risk, then I think it becomes more intelligible why it is that people might want to get back to normal, um, to kind of stay where they are, um, to, to not act on the information in the way that we expect them to or think they should. How are the costs of climate change defined and distributed? Who pays for climate change in the end? How much do they pay? And I think flood insurance gives us a window onto that because looking at how the kind of benefits and burdens of living in relation to the water are constructed and shared gives us a good clue into how those costs are going to be organized in the future. <laughs>